Hello, this is Julie with Professional Materials Management, and I'm here today to talk about computerized inventory management. Most of us know, whether by instinct or from study, that we should be tracking our inventory in a way that allows us to tie it back to our work orders, but often we just don't know where to start. Today, we're going to take a look at how Professional Materials Management approaches the task of building the foundation that allows inventory tracking, and how this approach might also apply to your company. To track the total cost of a work order, you need to know both the cost of the labor and the cost of the inventory. Most people are already tracking labor cost, but not inventory cost. In order to track the cost of inventory, you need to tie the inventory issues to your work orders. To start with, you need to have the right people on the right jobs. Most people think of the physical labor part first, but further thought might lead you to a different plan. First, and probably foremost, you need people with the good product knowledge. They also need to be technically proficient with knowledge of how your software system works, fleet fingers, and be comfortable sorting and manipulating between screens. They should also be familiar with OSHA and local fire codes. This will potentially save extensive costs in research or reworks. Something else to consider is the cost versus the benefits of cleaning up an existing database compared to building an inventory database from the shelf. When I say building inventory from the shelf, I'm referring to the process of standing in front of a shelf of inventory, looking at a part in front of you, and capturing all of the information that you can glean from that part. The manufacturer's name and suppl number, supplier identification number, size information, and relevant measurements, or the applications for the product. When I say clean up an existing database, I'm referring to the process of taking an existing database and cleaning it up by manipulating the data that is already there into a more usable or relevant format. The important distinction is that you're only working with the data that you already have or data that you might derive from research, not what is actually on the shelf. When you build or enhance data from the shelf, you will capture data for products that you don't even know you have. Our experience at PM2 is that most companies have about twice as much product as they think they have because half of it isn't in their database. By gathering information from the shelf to the database, you can identify those items that aren't in the database. Additionally, you obtain an accurate physical inventory count right at the product level. This drives costs down, increases revenues from spend avoidance, and improves efficiencies across the board. Most of all, you build an accurate inventory database from which you can build the rest of your inventory management plan. So you already know you're going to need some help to get this done. Your manpower resources have been cut to the bones, but where can you find help? Well, first, you can look to your own internal people now with a fresh eye. You've been thinking in terms of physical hands and feet to move things, but now you can also look to the pool of people with technical skills and product knowledge. Another area to look for help would be your vendors. Your vendors are likely to have the product knowledge required and will sometimes be willing to help you with the process in the form of extra time organizing or item history. Another option would be to call a company like Professional Materials Management who specialize in this kind of work. This option would get the work implemented faster and would provide a complete solution from boots on the ground organization to a database built from shelf inventory and an accurate physical inventory count. A company like PM2 could even provide ongoing training to drive compliance over time. Finally, you might actually consider utilizing a combination of these resources um, with everyone helping a little bit. In making the decision, consider the time you have to complete the job, keeping in mind that the sooner it's implemented, the sooner you reap the cost-saving benefits, and also the quality, consistency, and completeness of the solution that you've chosen. So once you've decided who will implement your plan, let's explore what the plan should look like. First things first, you have to get the warehouse physically organized. Here are some standards that will help you define and stick to getting organized. The first thing to do is to separate out the dead and obsolete inventory from the viable inventory. Use the duct dust factor as your guide, but be alert to critical spares. Everything else is fair game for being separated out and potential disposal. Next, clear an area to start with. Begin separating products into family groups. Make a rule that there will be only one part per location and separate parts in bins so there are no mixed parts. Nothing should be on the floor. It should be either on shelves, racks, or pallets. If you find the same part in two locations, combine them into one. One location per product, wherever possible. 
two great rules of thumb when you're thinking about driving compliance is to make it obvious when something's out of place and to make it easier to put something where it belongs than to leave it out or put it in the wrong location. The next step is to develop a simple numbering scheme for your locations and to label them. Now understand here I'm talking about location numbers, not item numbers. Location numbers identify where you will find the product. Whether you're talking about location or item labels, there's some simple rules to think about. When you're choosing and applying your labels, apply them to the storage locations, not the product. The product is likely to get picked up and moved around and the box is likely to be thrown away. When choosing what type of labels you will use, consider your environment. Is the environment wet or does it get excessively hot? Both can do a real number on labels if they don't have adhesive designed for that particular environment. Magnetic labels are good for locations that need to be flexible or moved around, but they also get knocked off easily by forklifts. All of these things need to be considered when choosing your labels. Don't forget to label everything up high, pallet locations, everything. And then make maps of your locations and post those maps around the warehouse so people can find the products more easily. Even after your team has learned the layout, you'll have new hires or vendors or even other managers who will be placing or removing items from the shelf and you want to give them every opportunity to get things back into the right location. Finally, don't forget that the information you want displayed on the label has to fit on the label and the label has to fit on the shelf. Too big and it rolls over the side of the shelf too small and you don't have all the information you need displayed. The next step after you're organized and you have your locations labeled is to build a high quality database. I think the best way to show you what I mean by a high quality standardized database is to show you the before and after pictures. A poor quality database will have incorrect information or information put in the wrong field. It will have poor descriptions, maybe even one word descriptions that don't really differentiate one product from another. It will have incorrect or inconsistent units of measure, and it will have empty fields with missing information. So how do you build a high-quality standardized database? Well, you start by having a standardized format to build to. We use a noun modifier attribute format that lines all of your motors up when you search on the word motor, for example, followed by all the modifiers and then followed by the attributes. Building in this format helps build a complete standardized description that really speeds up searches. Finally, print and affix the item labels using the same considerations that we addressed above when we discussed location labels. After you have printed and hung all of your item labels, now you perform your inventory count. Now you don't need me to tell you how to do this, but I will remind you that in order to keep your inventory as accurate as possible, you should schedule cycle counts and stick to that schedule. Be sure to resolve discrepancies at every count. Okay, so now what? You have a system in place, but in order to keep it in place, you need to make sure everyone is trained and comfortable with the processes to keep it that way. Finally, measure your progress and your successes along the way, and be sure to revisit what you've done, tweaking your processes to fit your individual unique situation. The better the fit, the better the compliance, and the better you'll be able to use the information. So I know I presented a lot of information in a very short period of time. If I've generated questions, well, good. It shows that you're thinking, and I'm happy to help answer any of these questions that come up. Feel free to seek answers from our website listed here, or call me directly. Thank you for your time.